The Holocaust became the focus of a trial in London last month when the historian David Irving sued an American writer for libel and lost. Irving, who claimed that there were no systematic gassings of Jews in Auschwitz, was branded by the judge as an active Holocaust denier, anti-Semitic and racist, and an associate of right-wing extremists who promote Nazism. Why does he think he lost so badly? David Irving, welcome to the program. Yes, hello. In the introduction the new to the new edition of Hitler's War, you quote what you call a scornful adage, and you say to historians is granted a talent that even the gods are denied to alter what has already happened. Was that you giving the game away and telling us exactly what you've been doing well, I'd, in I'd, history I'd, since 1988? I'd add a category to that. Not only historians can do it, but apparently lawyers can also do it. And, but you and, did it in this I'd case, according to the judge, didn't yeah. you? No, I, I, I don't agree, and I had to be careful what I say about in commenting on the trial because we're going to go to appeal on this. So I had to be careful not to try and second-guess the judge. Well, the record of the judge already stands, what he said, doesn't yes. he? I mean, Irving has, for his own ideological reasons, persistently and deliberately misrepresented and manipulated historical evidence. Yeah, th this isn't the view of a lot of historians, but of course... Which I is the view of a lot of historians, yes. isn't it? A lot of historians, is, uh, there's a consensus of historians who, who obviously don't like me, and I must admit that if I was invited to be a an expert witness in this case, as several historians were, for the defence, and I'd been offered £100,000 to testify against David Irving, then I would find it difficult to refuse as well. And that was the amount of money that was poured into this case. So you're saying Professor Richard Evans, Professor of Modern History mm -hmm. at Cambridge, deliberately lied and uh, falsified his version of events or his record on you uh, for money? Oh, no, I can't say that, of course. He was paid... Well, seven, that's what you are saying. He was paid £76,000 to write a report, and that gave him the confidence that he needed in order to smear me from one end of the country and, in fact, around the world. Well, he and didn't smear be, you, did he? Yes. He said what he thought, you know, your record was like. Yeah, d with, without, <laughs> without having heard me cross-examine him in the witness box, and he turned out to be not exactly expert on the history of the Third Reich. In fact, his knowledge of German was in, in, on occasions lamentable. Um, I, I was astonished that a, per, per, a person of his qualifications can rise to be a, a professor of history at Cambridge. But he was astonished by you. He said he yes. wasn't prepared for the sheer depth of duplicity in your treatment of sources. I wouldn't trust him about what he said Hitler had for breakfast. Yes, he wouldn't so. throw me as far as he would throw a grand piano either. Well, he's but not it, alone it, in that, is but he? But if you read the judge's verdict, you'll see the judge also says, I don't agree with a lot of the negative things that Evans in particular has had to say about Mr. Irving. Pity the judge wasn't specific about what he didn't agree with. Well, you still lost, mm. didn't he? He found oh, against yes. you. Whatever oh, yes. nice things the judge may have said <laughs> as well. He certainly didn't retract the other things. He said for the same reason he's portrayed Hitler in an unwarrantedly favourable light, particularly mm. in relation to his attitude towards responsibility for the treatment of the Jews, misinterpreting and mistranslating documents. I think when we come to misinterpreting and mistranslating documents, the Court of Appeal will have something to say about the judge in this case. Yeah. I have to be very careful what and I if say it doesn't, here. And if it doesn't? Then, then of course, I and go the down judgment in flames. Stands. Then I crash in flames. We already have, haven't we? We, we? We're crashing in flames, but you've got to realise I was a, a, a lone litigant in this case, facing people who had poured about £10 million into, in, into defending the action that I had brought. Into finding if, out the truth. If, if, if the truth was there in the archives, hidden for the last 55 years, it shouldn't have taken £10 million to prove me wrong. And at the end of the day, the judge was rather scratching his head in his judgment. The judge says, I had always assumed that there was the evidence that Auschwitz had gas chambers, and I was surprised to find that there wasn't until this case came along. It wasn't documentary evidence, yes. is what he said. didn't say there wasn't any evidence. Yes. He said there wasn't documentary evidence. Yes, there were evidence. eyewitnesses, and he relies on half a dozen eyewitnesses, and that's not good enough for me. I'm afraid I want to see, I want to see documents. If all the shootings on the Eastern Front are documented, there's no doubt that the Nazis killed millions of Jews on the Eastern Front, and we've got any number of documents on that, but nothing for the gas chambers. Talk, that talk, talking of relying on documents, you seem to have relied for, for your central thesis that there was no mass gassing of Jews in Auschwitz on a man called Frederick Leuchter, mm. who had no formal training in engineering or forensic science, but took some samples from brickwork and plasterwork in Auschwitz yes. and converted you overnight in 1988 to his findings. Yes, I don't think the no formal training stands against him. As I pointed out in... Well, he wasn't a forensic uh, scientist, was he? In the cross-examination of their chief witness, Professor Van Pelt, who is a professor of architecture in, in Canada, it turns out he never qualified as an architect. Uh, he would be arrested if he called himself an architect, and yet he was paid £109,000 to give evidence against me in this case. This is the, the odd kind of case I find myself in. 
I find myself baffled by the way the legal system works. But you acknowledge there were flaws in the Leuchter report. I mean, you said criticism yeah. of the Leuchter report had to be taken on board. These are your words. Yes. And that probably concessions have to be made at both ends of this scale. So despite defending this man's integrity and his scrupulous methods, you still acknowledge that there were errors in his report. No, when I published his report in June 1989, in the introduction, I said it's a pity that uh, th there are things that forensically one would have liked to have seen done differently. It's flawed, and I said that at the time. But the forensic tests were. But you also out. said you were converted by it. Oh, by the, you I was were converted, converted by a flawed report. I was converted by the laboratory tests that the flawed report contained. Uh, there had been lab tests conducted on the fabric of the so-called gas chambers at Auschwitz, which found no significant traces of cyanide, which is what set my mind thinking. I have to admit. Leuchter and, claimed that mm -hmm. the samples of concrete taken from the walls at Auschwitz. Um, gas chambers contain qualities of quantities of hydrogen cyanide that were too low to kill human beings, and thus he suggested the chambers were for delousing. Mm. As it came out at the trial, the truth was the reverse. The real amount of hydrogen cyanide needed to kill humans is 20 times lower than that needed to kill lice. That's a convincing argument, isn't it? It isn't. It's a, it's a very clever kind of argument used by the defence lawyers. But if you've got a gas clever chamber... Clever kind of argument used by you on a lot of occasions. If you've got a, a, a so-called gas chamber, a room about this size in which a, a, allegedly half a million people have been gassed by cyanide and you find there's no trace no significant trace whatsoever of cyanide left in the concrete now and there should be because it turns into a very permanent substance called Pr Prussian blue that sets my mind thinking I mean, the tests have been replicated since then by other reputable uh, scientists and the same result has come up and it, there's other reasons also for doubting this not just the forensic tests how saddened are you by the state of your reputation i mean you went <laughs> sad you, not the word you, i'm horrified you, horrified. you went to court in a sense to salvage a reputation that yes. you no longer had i had you? no choice uh, the, the enemies of the truth as i call them were conducting a mudslide and the mudslide was building up and it was being financed on a colossal scale around the world with a single dedicated aim of destroying david irving and what Consequ about your colossal support i mean you've had what 4000 supporters well, around the world d d not they don't have the kind of money that Steven Spielberg has. How do we has. know? How do we know? Well, I can tell you they don't. Well, well, you I've, don't I've, tell us who they are. Do I you? have. I throw my records open to a journalist, the Jewish Chronicle. I said, here you are. I have a look at the computer. You can look at the, he, he sat there 15 minutes going through all the records. And I said, as long as you don't write down names, you can look to your heart's content. I'm, I'm that so open. So where have you, taken, where have you taken money from? We, we have a very broad base of supporters around the world. People who give me the smallest amount, I suppose, $2. The largest amount is $50,000. But you take money from any group? Anywhere? If, if Ku Klux there, Klan? If, if, there's no, if there's no strings attached to it, I will take money from whoever will support my legal fight. No money too dirty for you to take? Oh, come on. <laughs> you, have you seen the kind of money well, that's asking, been poured into this case you, by my opponents? I'm, this I'm, is, this I'm is asking a really, you the kind of money that you would take. This is a really dirty fight being fought against me. This is money being fought Why is it by a dirty the, fight? By they the would big say, money. They we, would say that you distorted the truth. We've only just found out, after the case was over, how much money was paid to the witnesses. We've only just found out, after the trial was over, where the money came from. And Paying expert witnesses isn't unique to this trial, is it? I, I, I'm, I'm sad to hear. I'm sad to hear this. I, I didn't pay my witnesses a penny. They spoke because they spoke from their expertise. They spoke from their knowledge as professors and as historians. So you see this as a giant conspiracy and a Jewish conspiracy yes. again against uh, Irving. I, I'm sorry to say that this is this poor is, uh, Irving. David, <laughs> David against Goliath. Yes, for the for the last I suppose 20 years, the various bodies. It's not the Jews as such. It's just certain self-appointed leaders of the Jewish community. Uh, who quite demonstrably, because we have the documents, they were in court. They weren't relevant. The judge quite rightly said, these aren't relevant to the case, Mr. Irving. But I put them in just because I wanted the world to know what I've been up against for the last 20 years. You've enjoyed the publicity attendant with this case. Um, it, it had... There were two exhilarating qualities. The exhilaration of standing in the high court and cross-examining witnesses and see them crumble. In your best did. Savile Row suit. In my best Savile Row suit. Which made um, you feel superior. Which made me feel immensely superior to the kind of people I was up against, <laughs> is no question. I, was, I certainly never felt inferior one moment to any of those expert witnesses. I ran rings around them. I made them confess that they had no qualifications. I made them confess well, they didn't know German. You, yet you still managed to lose. You called the judge mein Führer at one particular point. Why? You look at the transcript. No, I'm this, asking this is you. What, I'm this asking is one you of those why. legends. I'm asking you why. This is one of those legends. Well, did you or didn't you? I'm, I, there's a passage in the, in the transcript where I'm saying what the crowd is calling out to me. Neo-Nazis and others I'm addressing in Halle and they're calling out things like Zeke Heil and they're calling out things like Mein Führer and I say this and if you look at that it's quite plain and if the journalists wanted to report it the other way I'm, I can't be responsible for them. One of the additional charges was that you misinterpreted evidence. Now, mm -hmm. a document crucial to you was a telegram from Hitler's headquarters, November 1941, requiring that one transport of Jews from Berlin to the East should not be liquidated. The document referred to one transport of Jews. Yeah. And you misconstrued this to mean that no transports 
of Jews should be murdered. Well, Why? Tim, Tim, I'm sure you know German. If, if, you, if, if you see the, the German word Judentransport, just by itself, with no context at all, the word transport can mean transportation, the transportation of Jews. Or it can mean a single transport. And without the context to know what, exactly what was going on, I translated that back in 1977. When I, I was the first person to transcribe Himmler's handwriting. That's why I found it. I said the transports of Jews from Berlin have to stop. No liquidation. But very rapidly, another expert, Gerald Fleming, who's a British historian, contacted me. He said, no, this refers to a particular train load, David. This is a well-known train load that went to Riga. And in the next edition of the book, I changed it. These are the kind of misinterpretations that go on the whole time when you're, when you're pioneering in history, when you're reading somebody's handwritten documents nobody else has ever bothered to read. You make errors of interpretation. So you acknowledge first... errors of interpretation. Yes, good Lord. And uh, mistranslations. Yes. If, if, out, of, out of a desire to, to get them to say what you wish they would have that's said. That's what the judge says. That's what the judge said, but that, that interpretation I totally reject. You've got the two kinds of historians. You didn't convince him, did in, you? No, I didn't. In, in court, and I said on, on the last day in the court, as, when he finished reading out of judgment, I stood up <laughs> and I said, my lord, I have to admit that I've obviously failed to convince you and I blame myself that I'm not able to persuade you that the historical documents have to be read the way that they should be read. And it's my fault. And the next time round, when we come to the court of appeal, we will rectify that. You the, hope? Yes. Well, no, no question. Of course, and there's a question. There's a huge question over it. Well, there's a question whether the Court of Appeal even allows me to appeal. That's the first hurdle we have to cross. And there's a question whether we can raise the hundred thousand pounds that's going to be necessary in order to 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 establish the the security for, for, for costs, which will undoubtedly be required by the defendants in this action. On the allegations, it's all, it's all, it's all about money. You see, it's about people. With but it wealth. isn't about money. It's about the truth, and it's about your it reputation. It's about, isn't it's it? about multi-millionaires fighting somebody who hasn't got the means to defend himself, namely myself. And I'm doing it's the best I can. It's not a question can. of means. It's a question of whether you actually told the truth or not. Yes, that, it doesn't matter what's spent to try and prove the truth. That's, that's what this whole trial was about, wasn't yes. it? It wasn't yes. about money, it was about the truth. No, it wasn't. It was about and you've money. done everybody a favour in many people's eyes by, by proving that these theories of yours were, were false. It wasn't. It was about money. Right from day one. If the truth was as, plain, as plainly written as they made out, they wouldn't have needed to have a courtroom filled with 30 lawyers and historians and experts and research assistants and all the rest of it who had spent 20 man years to try and prove me wrong. You did the favour of, of getting them to have it conclusively proved, didn't no, you? No, we didn't. We, we spent no money at all. We paid no money at all on no, I said you did them a favour of getting them. You persuaded them to spend a lot of money to prove that your views were conclusive. I don't think so. I think false. if anybody reads the transcript, they will say, that's funny. The eyewitnesses say there was holes in the roof where they poured the cyanide in through, and yet the roof is there, and there's no holes. Well, the people have argued that and consistently. The judge says, I mean, this is something you've come well, out with. It's been, it's been comprehensively challenged in court yeah, but time I and said, time again. I said to the defendants halfway through the trial, you're whinging about the money this case is, is costing. If you go to Auschwitz tonight and scrape the mud off that roof, and find the holes in the roof on the top side. You can't see them from the bottom side. If you find the holes in the roof, then I will capitulate. Tomorrow I'll come to court and I'll wind up the whole action. And they so why did, the, go. why did the judge talk about overwhelming convergence? The judge said, promise? and I have to admit there are Englishmen like this, the judge said, I believe the eyewitnesses and not the roof. And this is where I can only say, well, you pay your money and you take your choice. David Irving, when asked if you're a racist, mm. you talked about an emotional, instinctive aversion to people from other cultures. Yes. You have that. You I'm, I'm that honest, yes. I mean, I could just have stood in the witness box and said, no, I'm not a racist, but... I, I, you acknowledge justice, being justice, a racist. No. I, I don't think I'm probably any more racist than, than no, you are uh, or anybody else. We're I'm, not comparing. I'm talking yes. about you. I, yes. I, you would classify yourself as a racist. You have done. You've said I'm a racist. No, I, I haven't. I haven't said I'm a racist. You and did. This is a you typical thing taken out of, out of context. In, in There's this film on, on Fred Leuchter where... The producer said, Mr. Irving, put yourself in various positions. Now, now imagine you're a, you're a communist, now imagine you're a Jew, now imagine you're a racist. And when we came to the one that began with, now I'm a racist, I began by saying, right, now I'm a racist, and I say that. And that's all they quoted. You said this that in one of your comments about the Jews. I would say that as a race, they are better at making money than I am. That's yes. a racist remark. This is you, you think talking. So? No, this is you talking. Yes. That's a racist remark. If mm. I was going to be crude, I would say that not only are they better at making money, but they are greedy. Yeah. So you write off the whole Jewish nation as greedy. You don't that, think that's that a racist that's, comment? That's my perception of them. But that is a racist comment, isn't it? I, I don't think so. It's, it's a perception of the way the Jews are and the way that I see them in the newspapers. And You see them as greedy. You've written them off as 
greeting? Well, as a result of their campaign over the last five years to lay their hand on all the Swiss gold and to beat up the French But well, you don't just talk about the last the five years, you talk about the last 3,000 years. They've been hated for the last 3,000 years. This is another problem. Uh, I, I agree this is a problem which they themselves are not addressing enough attention to. If, if I was a Jew, and I frequently say this, and I find myself being put into a pit and machine gun to death with my family, I would want to know in my last few dying seconds why, is, why are they doing it to me. Why is it us Jews again and again who are being victimized like this? There must be some reason for it. There must be something in the human microchip, which I think is to just which, To which that. you always wish to draw attention to as a stick to beat them? I don't think so. I think it's xenophobia. I think there's an element of xenophobia in everybody. And, and is your xenophobia when you say, if you're a man and you go into a men's public toilet and there's yeah. a black man or Pakistani standing at one store, then you go two or three stores possibly further away? It's instinct, yes. It's, the, the little in, it's the, a racist the, the, instinct, isn't yeah, it? The microchip kicks in and... and I think you'll probably find that millions of people around the world listening to this will say, well, I have to Why do you always justify yourself by right. saying, well, millions of other people feel the same thing? There's no scientific evidence to suggest that millions of people feel the same thing. Do you feel, do you feel in better company saying these things by thinking, oh, well, there are plenty of other people out there who feel the same way? Well, I've been around the world. And Does I've that somehow justify your views? I, I've, been, I've been around the world and I've spoken to other human beings now. Millions of feel. them, presumably. No, but I've, a reasonable cross-section of them. You quote millions of them. A reasonable cross-section of them. And I suspect strongly there's millions of people out there who say, yeah, David... I you suspect, David so Evans it's not right. a scientific fact, it's what yeah. you suspect. Mm. You said, um, you told The Independent once you recalled seeing uh, a black man on a bicycle coming towards you in Florida. Mm. And at the moment he became confused and couldn't decide whether to go this way or that. He crashed into me and nearly broke my finger. I screamed at him, you stupid nigger. I, and I, I told The Independent, I, I'd never actually revealed that story before. I told The Independent that I was so ashamed of that having happened that when I went home to my little cottage on the island where I, where I stay in America, where no one could see, I went down on my knees and I, 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 I pleaded to God for forgiveness. And it's, 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 it's I use, it's, it's a, a just un, a totally unforgivable. I've never used that word before. I've never used it since. I, I would find it difficult to say it even now. It was pretty close to hand when you wanted it, wasn't it? I mean, it was just right there on it the is, tip it of your tongue, It is inside your it? brain, buried somewhere in, in an ugly corner of your brain, and in a moment of great pain it comes out, and you wish you hadn't said it, and, and you know that he's seen you and he's heard you saying it, and you go and apologise. And that's all you can do. What about the charge of inciting racial hatred? Well, I think that's an odious charge. And I don't know how anyone could possibly accuse me of that. Well, you've, of that. You, you've, um, you've acknowledged <coughs> that you're tasteless. I'm tasteless and enough in, to say in, that people in rebutting, are... In rebutting stories about Auschwitz, you've actually recommended being tasteless. Well, you think, is that in, nine, in 1991, yes. a speech at Calgary, you said the yes. only way to overcome the pseudo-religious atmosphere... Is to use tastelessness, yes. Yes, yes, is to treat these little legends with the ridicule and bad taste they deserve. You've got yes. to say things like, more women died on the back seat of Senator Edward Kennedy's car at Chappaquiddick than died in the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Why is it the business of a historian to be so tasteless and so hurtful to no. people who may have had relatives who suffered or died at Auschwitz to ram your views down their throat. But suppose that Why? particular statement is true. If well, that but more people died on the back seat of Senator than Kennedy's in that fake gas car, chamber at Auschwitz. Well, you know, you know it's the one not. They show the yes, the one they show the tourists was built in 1948. You know it's not. The Poles have admitted it was built in 1948. And nobody, nobody it was repaired, repaired. Nobody said it was it's, built it's, for the first it time. It's a totally fake building. They, they built a chimney behind it which isn't even connected to the a main lot building. Of, a lot of Auschwitz it's was like in Disneyland. ruins, as you know. It's like Disneyland. And the only way you can get people to realise... It was in ruins. It was in ruins. No. There are plans that exist. They have, they have uh, even Van Pelt... You Pelt, know that. There are plans to exist. Even the 100,000-pound expert admits that what they show the tourists is fake. Why He's written a whole chapter about so it. so tasteless? Why so needlessly hurtful? You have to be tasteless because Why? it is the Why only way to bring to this tasteless? extraordinary fact home to the world that what they show the tourists in Auschwitz is largely fake. They've destroyed the integrity. There's no doubt that... Tens or even hundreds of thousands of people died at Auschwitz from various causes. And, and you don't have the examined. slightest qualm because using the, language like yes, this, designed to hurt you have and to, wound people. You have to. You case. have to. 
Who else does? One has Nobody to, else in this does. case. You feel you have to. Because over the whole of the Auschwitz complex has been put this, this glass cheese cover, so to speak, and no one's allowed to go near it and lift up the cheese cover and say, I want to investigate that, because they put this word Holocaust over the top, and they made it a criminal offence in many countries around the world, even to look at what happened in Auschwitz. And look what happened to me when I started questioning Auschwitz. And that should make people suspicious. Well, What's let's, look, with what, this let's, place? let's look what yes. happened to you. I mean, speaking for right-wing organisations in Germany, the DVU, the Deutsche Volksunion. Yes. Um, what's their creed? I mean, you take it off their website. Denial of Wehrmacht crimes and of German war guilt in general. Mass murder of German civilians by the Allies. The mm. recreation of greater Germany. Why do you speak for people like that? When I was first invited to go and speak to the German People's Union, it was about 1984, I wrote a letter to the German embassy, being a, a cautious person, and I said, I've been invited to speak to this body. Will you tell me, are they lawful? Are they constitutional? Do you recommend me not to? And the German embassy wrote me back a very nice letter saying they are perfectly lawful. I they're didn't say they weren't lawful. I told you these were the views they espoused. constitutional body, and there are no reasons why you shouldn't address this organization. You, you agree with the views they espoused? No, then? I don't. But what I do... Then why do you address them, then? It is useful that I go and speak to these people, many of whom are incorrigible, Many of, whom, many of whom even I would find incorrigible, so you can imagine how incorrigible they are. And I give them a taste of the truth. I read out to the them. The truth that they like, the truth that happens to coincide the, with the contrary, their no, views. I've, Why are you fated by I these have read people? Out, I have read You're out. You're the darling of these right-wing groups. Yeah, because I'm regarded as the bringer of truth. And totally unpartage, I'm totally impartial between, between the warring parties. I, that's, I'm that's, not interested. that's why they fate. Impartial enough to attend a dinner in 1990 to mark Hitler's birthday? Totally, <laughs> totally untrue. Held by the well-known neo-Nazi Ewald Althans. It's in your diary. You talked have, about people have, rising and toasting. Have you never had people in your, in your surroundings who on April the 20th say, oh, it's Adolf Hitler's birthday, let's drink I'm a toast to him? You probably no. haven't. No, I uh, haven't. No, have you, you have, members clearly. Of, members of Parliament in this you country? Have clearly. Alan Clark once came to visit me. Does it, does it make it better? You he always, sent me a, You a, always drew attention birthday. to what other people are doing. I'm talking about what you I, do. I, I'm, I'm talking trying, about the kind of company that you keep. I'm trying to draw attention to, the, to, to, to normal people with, with normal, with normal people? red Not in the normal world that I recognize. Red blooded sense of humor and red blooded. Oh, instincts. so this is a sense of humor toasting Hitler's birth. I, I find it totally tasteless, and that's why I refused to totally join in. Well, you said because you didn't have a glass. Well, that's, that's the obvious proof that I didn't join in. I find it, that's why I wrote it in my diary. I find it incredibly tasteless that they should do this. You, uh, what do you think of Hitler? Well, it's a rather wide question. It's like, hmm. where do you stand on Jesus Christ? <laughs> um, hmm. So they're two very different personalities. Admire him. Um, let me start at the other end of the question. I, I was in Johannesburg a few years ago being interviewed by the editor of the City Press, which is a black newspaper, and he was black and his name was Adolf. And I said, how come your name is Adolf? And he said, Mr. Irving, people of the third world, their parents frequently called their children Adolf in, in, in memory of Adolf Hitler. And I was astonished by this and I said, why? He said, well, because in third world countries they regarded him as the hero and the champion of the underdog. And for a long time that was the case. In the early 1930s he was that way, when he came to power. And until about 1937, 1938, you can say, had he died then, had he been fallen victim to an assassin's gun, they would have erected a statue to him in Hitler, uh, in Germany. Do you admire him? As a military commander, unquestionably. He, he with, with, withstood the entire combined might of the, of the Allied nations until, well, for six years. Um, he very nearly won World War II. If it, had, if it had lasted seven years, he probably would have, because the Allies would have run out of steam. We had no manpower left, and, and the will to fight had gone. David um, But I think politically, of course, he went wrong. He was a bad leader. He was a bad dictator. He, he allowed things at home to go to rot while he ran, ran the war, and you can't, you can't do that. That's, that's the basic problem with all dictatorships. How saddened are you by the fact that various members of your family have rejected your views. This is what the newspapers say, it's totally untrue. Well, they quote your daughter Paloma, for instance, saying, I'm completely opposed to his beliefs in terms of women. That's another issue. What he says is mm. a joke. I think she was referring to your description of women as mental chewing gum. I, I don't think I said that. I have pointed out to the fact that their brains are a marvel of miniaturization. And, uh, but your daughter a, Pilar said, my views yes. and my family's views are totally opposed to his, and anyone who reads what he says must find them totally laughable. Does that, does that upset you? These, these daughters have been in touch with me over the last few days to say these quotations are fictitious and invented. I've seen so the same thing said about my twin brother. So they support you fully? A national newspaper said that I'm, I'm at loggerheads with my twin brother, and this is also totally untrue, and one wonders where the newspapers find these things. But you as a journalist, you know this is the way new newspapers report. That's why I find live television is, has such an, such an edge and such an advantage. It's much more honest. Well, you can catch me out. You can, you can bring tears into my eyes by asking me certain questions, but on the other hand, I have a chance to say things as they are. We'll watch your appeal with interest, David Irving. Thank you very much indeed.